I want to welcome everybody, especially want to welcome our guests that are with us today. Sarah Stevens is uh, hosting uh, the Zoom today, and I want to thank Sarah for putting this together along with Mark uh, Mazi and the Communications Committee. Okay, thank you, Mitch, <clears throat> and uh, a welcome to you all. We have an outstanding panel today. This is our eight Oh My Talk. Our Oh My Talks are focused on inviting leaders in opera, leaders and influencers to talk about some of the topics that we all really care about and are interested in seeing some change in. This talk is going to be focusing on vocal education and entering the business of opera and the changing world that we're living in and how we can make a difference. So I want to introduce each one of our guests. Emily is the uh, new director of the Paris Conservatory of Music and Dance. She was previously director at the European Academy of Music at, in Aix-en-Provence at the festival, which is where I think a lot of our managers know you, Emily. She also has worked at La Monnaie in Brussels. Emily, one of your major focuses was youth orchestras. Emily has an interesting background. She has a degree in engineering and finance. I'm not sure how you got from engineering into opera, but that would be an interesting story to tell. Emily is uh, 44 years old. You are the first woman director of the Paris Conservatory in over 200 years. It was founded in 1795. So that's quite an accomplishment. Emily oversees over 1,200 students. And I'm going to switch to uh, Sarah. Sarah Bade Wilson was born in London. She played piano and violin, was concertmaster in her youth for many different organizations. She studied languages, French and German in Cambridge. She came to Germany in the 1990s to be a fund man manager at the Kölner Philharmonie. She's worked in Innsbruck at the Early Music Festival and one of my favorite places, Schloss Elmau. She was the interim president at the Mozarteum and headed or was part of the Arts Executive Search Committee. Sarah is in Berlin at the Hans Eisler Musikhochschule, which is, I think, the smaller of the institutions that we're talking about today. You have then there's Chris Rochester, who is the new director of the Global Music Initiative at the McPhail Center for Music. And McPhail is probably a name that most of you don't know. Um, I grew up in Minneapolis and took, uh, took lessons from McPhail, and actually I'm taking piano lessons again there. One of the largest private music institutions in the country. It was founded uh, almost 100 years ago and, ha and ha now has a Frank Gehry-like building in the center of Minneapolis. Chris is a musician, an educator, a composer. He studied and played with some of the most well-known jazz musicians of our time, including Scott Barnhart, who is now the current leader of the Count Basie Band. He studied at Berkeley, got his master's from Florida State, and he recently completed his PhD in music theory and composition from the University of Minnesota. So we're thrilled to have you on board, Chris. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Our last but not least guest is, of course, Melissa Wagner from the Metropolitan Opera. Give a wave, Melissa. Hello. Melissa is a former singer. She studied at Bard and at Manhattan School of Music. She joined the artistic staff at the Metropolitan Opera in 2000 and is currently the executive director of the Lindemann program, as well as the director of the Metropolitan National Auditions, which has now been named the La Pont Auditions. Melissa was named one of the top 30 musical managers from Opera America recently. She's worked at the New York City Opera, at BAM, at Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, and been a judge for um, multiple well-known vocal competitions. When I was researching this, one of the things that really struck me with all four of you is that you're fairly newly in your current positions. I think Emily was appointed in uh, 2019, Sarah in 2018 is Melissa in 2018 and Chris in 2020. So we do have a new generation of leaders in opera, influences and leaders that it, in this group here. The first question I'm actually gonna leave to Mark Mezzi. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Yes, my question, I'm, I'm from time to time invited to masterclass to auditions to conservatory schools, just to explain a little bit or, or always the career. I'm very surprised that most of the students have no idea of the jungle they will face after the conservatorium. Uh, it means they, it, it starts uh, or to present a biography or to take a contact with a theater, to take a contact with an agency, to, to present themselves in an audition. So they are very, uh, lost. They are totally lost once they leave the, 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 the conservatorium. So my question to, to the, the four of you, 
do you have in your institution some program, some approach to help uh, all these young artists? I'll go in the deep end um, and okay. take that up because this is our daily bread. <laughs> because actually, um, it's not even enough. I mean, you were talking about, um, do we have um, programs in place, Mark? Um, all conservatoires have programs in place, but actually the question um, goes one step further. How do we imprint on these wonderful, young, talented people that this is what they need also to be addressing? Making sure that we have the central focus um, on, the, on the artistic training that has always got to be the center of what we do but actually imprinting on each and every individual student what it means to go out there and in fact a lot of the conservatoires in Germany um, have a system with their students that they can come back and use the services of the career centers up to six years after they've left because very often it's this sort of springing into cold water um, and realizing oh my god I know nothing although the bigger problems we have are convincing the professors that the students need to be taking time to um, learn these skills in addition. That's also something I would love to hear my colleagues talk about. The situation is really different from Germany to France. Uh, first of all, uh, I don't know how many conservatoires is there in Germany, but maybe 20, 20, 24. In France, we have two for 66 million inhabitants. Uh, it means that we have less students in the musical field than Belgium or Netherlands. So people we have um, in the Paris Conservatoire are really the best uh, students we can have in France. So since 2008, uh, the system in Europe changed from uh, the licensed master and uh, doctorate system. So now students have to stay five years in the conservatoire to get their diploma. So they are more prepared and they have to stay five years instead of three before. So we have, I think, the opposite problem is that most of them are already in career when they're finishing their studying, uh, but still they have no idea about what the career <laughs> will looks like. I think maybe the, the things that are less prepared is to, to sing with the orchestra. That they don't have enough experience on that. Let me just read you something that a friend of mine recently sent to me who was in a master's program in design, in website design. They offer, during the course of their master's program, a mentorship personal and professional development, LinkedIn training, resume writing, portfolio guidance and review, projects, headshots, and two police teachers in the classroom uh, during their time of studies. I think other fields actually do a much better job of preparing the students what they need to do after they've completed their degrees. So let's go to Chris. Sure, I actually think it's a significant problem uh, across the board, regardless of style of music. It's one of those things where um, there's been a system built when we're talking about um, studying any kind of music, regardless of whatever style of music, I don't think we're set up in a way, uh, and when I say we, I mean most of uh, most education systems are set up in a way to really foster the next step, um, be it mentorship, uh, LinkedIn training, that isn't actually enough. And then there's this generation gap. Over at McPhail, we recently started a new program called Electronic Mu Music and Recording Arts called EMRA. Um, and it's really intending to train this next generation of uh, musicians um, because whether you're doing opera, jazz, or anything, uh, electronic music, recording arts, that's going to be there. But we're not having a lot of these conversations because we're sticking to the systems that have, have been here through history. Yeah, it's a significant problem. The If the question is, how do we fix it? How do we address it? Those are the significant systemic changes that need to happen uh, across the board. So that is not a part of the current conversation in, in regards to uh, music education. Um, and it needs to be if, if you yeah. kind of want to be successful. Thank you. It's so great to hear from our colleagues about this. It is, I think, a really big hindrance to the industry overall, um, this kind of lack of awareness that students are coming out of their programs uh, about what they're getting into. Um, I myself was a double major in undergrad in music business and vocal performance. And I think I've always kind of had my eyes open because of the dual degree. My two programs that I run are, are very different. The Lindemann program is right now 14 artists, 12 singers and two pianists. So I, I have very specific conversations with them about their specific career paths. On the kind of bigger picture is some of the work I get to do with the competition because we're in uh, 
36 cities in the US, Canada, and Mexico. And we offer feedback to singers after each of those auditions, uh, panels of three judges. And so we've really overhauled that feedback system to make sure that we are actually interacting in a very positive way so that the singers are not um, becoming embittered with the industry before they even really enter it. I look at all of the singers that are in program studying to be our future audiences, our future donors, our future volunteers, our future leaders. We know numerically that they're not all going to have um, top level professional careers, but as long as they can stay connected to why they wanted to major in it and keep that on as part of the creative community in the future, that's really important to me. I think one of the distressing things about, um, in particular, the American system is that there, as you say, Melissa, and, and actually thank you for saying that, that many of those singers that are coming out of the conservatories will probably not have what we call sustainable careers. We find that often they're not tuned into that, and so they do get embittered and they do get kind of angry at the industry. And moreover, they have incredible student debt. That's what you I was know, just going to say. Right. And I, I, that's something I wish we would talk more about. If you go to an undergraduate degree and then have a master's in, in vocal studies and then have a vocal diploma on top of it, we're talking about seven years of education in the United States. If you don't get a scholarship for that, you may have up to 100000 maybe $150,000 of debt. Then there are the young artist programs after that, which pay little or nothing. And so that really narrows the play field in a very immediate way. And I think a lot of those uh, students are not prepared for that. Well, I can only comment in that, you know, we're in the, in the very, very fortunate position in Germany is that there is no debt because, you know, there is such a great scheme of scholarships here that we've built up specifically at the Eisler, um, but also the fact that there are no fees to be paid um, to study here, which is what makes schools at the very top. And I mean, you know, yes, there are 24 music schools in Germany, but the Eisler um, with the focus on the artistic education and just 500 students um, is absolutely at the top of the tree. Um, I'd just like to um, take up on one thing you were just saying just now, Sarah, about the opera studios and the young artist programs. We tend to find, you know, like Emily was saying, that the students are actually part of those while they're with us. And that is hugely important is to have them being accompanied. But it's very important that the students get the opportunity. Also the choral programs, you know, an awful lot of the singers that we train as you say, are not going to have those sustainable careers as soloists because there just aren't the jobs out there. It can be just as valuable to go into opera choruses. One of the things that really is important to me in tackling this issue is transparency. Especially in the US, we could be much better about communicating data. How many music majors do we have? What is their average um, tuition bill? How many jobs are there in young artist programs upon graduation? I think this data is available. We're not connecting it to the students who are studying. Again, it, that goes to that shock value of when they graduate in our country with a lot of debt and then find out how much they can make singing Rosina at a C-level American company if they're lucky enough to get hired. Well, I teach at a university, and one of the biggest problems right now is enrollment across the country is down, which means music schools are taking everybody. As a teacher myself, two really important things. I asked the singers in the very beginning, what is their goal? And if their goal is not something that's sustainable, I tell them then, maybe you need to be adding. We have a great music business program. We add them into that as a double major like Melissa had done. So the teachers have to be very honest with their students and not just fill these dreams. First of all, how hard our business is. And so I think teachers have to be very honest with their students and I do not find that to be the case in our business. Uh, I think for the financial issues, we are quite a, uh, in a similar situation than uh, Sarah has just uh, described. I think the relationship also with the choir is something important. Uh, I mean, in France, we don't have this tradition of choir. We have only uh, 60 singing students. It means 12 new each year. Uh, so we don't train a lot of, uh, of the choir members in France. Uh, we want to make some change, so it's compulsory to have uh, some choir experience during the courses. I actually kind of want to hint to something that uh, Mark was kind of getting at. And essentially, every kind of society has its protectors. They protect the status quo, and it has its fraternities that are indifferent to change, and they sleep through all the revolutions. Um, and I, I think that's the professors. I think it's um, 
much more of an issue than kind of we, we think it is. Some of the changes that we're talking about in many ways, and I, I can't necessarily speak for the education system in Europe, but at least in the United States, some of the changes that we would like professors to take on are counteractive to their own careers. Most of the people at the table are fully aware of what's going on. Uh, it's like these kind of taboo word incoming elite organizations at the top of the, the, the opera world. Um, but what about kind of everyone else? Okay. And if we don't start addressing the everyone else, then we're really going to have issues. Um, and it's already, you know, becoming more apparent in numbers across the board for all of music. And, and Melissa used this word earlier, awareness. It is really a significant thing that you can spend years on uh, improving and still be at you know, step one. I just have a comment. When I stopped singing, I spent several years chairing the graduate opera program at the Hart School. And I often found myself in master classes or even as a manager in master classes with young artist programs throughout the world, saying that what we're really doing is training the next great ambassadors for the art form. My question for you is, do you feel that perhaps we spend too much time concentrating on one specific task as opposed to the interdisciplinary or, or really the cross-disciplinary things that a person can do in music. You know, I think that's really, really important, Mitch. We need to be doing all signs of repertoire. Um, and as far as um, other genres is, are concerned, I mean, it's a case of making sure that all the avenues are open. I think it's a very important question it's about how we balance. As I told before, we went from three years long to a five years long cursus now. So it's much more. And our singers, our trained, have a 35 hours of classes by week. It's huge for singers. We can always bring more uh, initiation to contemporary music, more uh, different repertoire, more theory, more many things. But uh, I think the questions linked to that for me is what's happening after the studies? Before from mm -hmm. one day to another, it's nothing. And that's not good. But maybe we have to think about schools, about how to accompany the first years of the professional life so they can come back. What we're talking about is that, and I think the key for us opera managers, again, is this transition period, which I think is actually one of the most important phases in education we will help in, in general, is, is that phase from when you've graduated and went to you're actually in your career. And in a singer's life, that's generally about three or four years. But let's just talk about one other thing that I think is crucial and also I think it affects the demographics of our business, which is who can afford this? I understand we've got two Americans here on the panel and we've got two Europeans. The Europeans have public funding and so they don't have student debt, but the problem is the same. And, and the Americans have, if they're lucky, they have scholarship and many of them will still in some form have student debts. But um, it's not like getting a degree in engineering or in finance where you can immediately go into a job. You've got to somehow finance that transition. And that takes years. And so what happens in that period and who gets left by the wayside? That often is where we don't select the best singers for this profession, because then it depends on who's backing them up. Do they have finances to back them up? Do they have independent finances? How do they, are they able to get scholarships and grants? How much do they get from competitions? That's where we see a real divide in who comes from a family that can support that and who doesn't. I think one of the issues here is that we have graduates in, let's say, vocal performance who actually don't ever get to perform. So they're investing a lot of time and money and they graduate without a role on their resume. But if they don't have the opportunity to actually try it out, it's not going to go. They are not going to be able to afford that if they've never actually tested out what they've been training to do. My colleagues in, in the jazz world, they were out performing and the singers kind of, you're waiting to be anointed that you've been given a role. Opera is expensive, but there are so many ways to use your voice. Sure, um, you kind of uh, made this comment, we aren't getting the best singers. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually don't think it's because of uh, a lack of the financial support. I think it's, um, because of uh, an overall lack of interest in, in the genre. And I told you this story, but when did I kind of first get into opera? It was because of Bugs Bunny. 
it was because of the Looney Tunes <laughs> watching um, uh, Elmer Fudd sing some Wagner. kind of yeah some <laughs> some some changed version of it what is the door in to something like this right what is the thing that is making that child at at, at any point in life say I want to do that and because those moments stand and we're not actively trying to create them, that's why we're not getting the best singers. I kind of think it's not necessarily fair all the time to say that it's because the, it's opera's expensive that people aren't pursuing it. I think that's one of those awareness things. People might not be pursuing it because it's just not on their radar. And it's our job to put it on their radar. Chris, isn't that one of the um, goals of the Global Initiative Institute that you are now director of? Yeah, that's exactly it. Kind of the bait, bait and hook kind of thing. Meeting students where they are and introducing them to things like opera, jazz. But if we cannot kind of meet them on their own ground, there's no way for us to make any progress. And then the numbers in education, the numbers in performances, our audience will slowly, slowly start to dwindle. Well, they already are dwindling. We know that. That's one of the one of the problems in all four of the classical arts, opera, classical music, jazz, and ballet. <laughs> Mitch? Well, but in a way, it does come back to money. Robin, who's on the call here, first started out singing. She was a resident soprano for Connecticut Opera. They used to doing the same productions five days a week, going to every school in the state. Opera companies have slowly lost that funding. And so while I totally agree with Chris that it's our job to get it out to the families and out to the public, you need money to do that. The difference is, as you say, Sarah, two from the States and two from Europe, the Metropolitan Opera has a big educational outreach, but most B and C houses in the United States have drastically cut those programs. So just real quick, if to get someone into opera, you have to have full-blown opera then that's not sustainable. You have to create the interest uh, in students. Once you start creating the interest, then we can talk about it feeding itself and to the point where operas uh, get more funding. But because we're not creating the interest in music and students, and once again, that's not just opera, that's kind of all of music, then we're not getting to the point where we could even talk about opera. There has to be kind of some door in for students, for, for kids, and it's not the high level, uh, best of the best thing you think it is. It, more often one person, one interaction with one student that creates the, the seed that allows it for uh, students to be interested in something. And it really gets back to kind of the core of where, of maybe where we can make a difference. I'd like to give a final word to each one of our panelists. Melissa, do you want to start? Sure. I, I think for me, it's just always a question of this balance between really encouraging passion and making sure that those people who have a, have a true almost need to make music are able to connect them with opportunities, then also to make sure that um, we're not leading them down some path that, that might not happen for them, but doing that in a way that's honest but kind so that they can turn around and be able to support this industry in different ways. I'm totally with Chris and that we have to be thinking differently. The world is different than when the conservatory model started. We have to be thinking about ways that we are creating new points of entry into all of this. Yes, I was thinking that uh, um, we have a very different system in Europe and we are luckily a lot of public funding for the opera world, but still facing the same questions about the sustainability of the opera art form because our public funded are, are under pressure. All the politicians are less and less going to the arts. We still are fighting to defend the fact that art is our life. So we need not only to do the best art form, but also to think how having a sustainable audience. So we have two terms with sustainable in them, the sustainable career and the sustainable audience. One of the things I spend a lot of time thinking about is, you know, how much is what we are doing here um, education in a very broad sense and how much is actually a training um, for a job? The word Bildung in German is education and Ausbildung is to train someone. And if you are not 150% convinced 
that what you are doing is the only thing you can possibly do, then you should be going off and doing something else. And in fact, you know, as, as Emily was saying, we need these audiences. Um, Chris was saying this as well. We have to train the audiences um, and we have to make sure that they're there in the future. And bear, we have to tear down those boundaries as well and making sure, make sure that there's a lot going on in the communities uh, and that there are possibilities to be exposed to this art form from a very, very early age. So there's still an awful lot of work to do. As Emily said, we're in a very different situation here in Europe, but I think we have the same problems all over the world. Chris? Yeah, I think we're at the point where we really need to uh, consider this being a conversation about survival. And it really depends on our abilities as leaders to be aware of what's going on, to adjust to new ideas, and to remain vigilant while challenging things that are going on. Our kind of biggest barrier will be indifference. I wish everyone the best of luck trying to fight that, but just know that we have to do this if we want to survive. I want to thank our panelists, Melissa, Sarah, <laughs> Emily, and Chris for joining us. And I wish we had more time. Thank you very much. I want to thank Sarah and Mark and Marcus um, for putting this together, especially Sarah for the work you did. Silenzio, silenzio, silenzio. Io son qui per giudicar. Io da lei sceltavo capo, vengo a far le sfere difese delle legittime pretese che io vi vengo a palesar. Io guardate, io guardate. Ah, silenzio, silenzio, silenzio. Io son qui per giudicar.